Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is uh, Mike Weider. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossroad, and uh, we're just thankful you're here today. As uh, Pastor Paul kind of already talked to you about a little bit, uh, we're continuing in week two of a, of a message series called Hot Topics, where we're actually delving into some pretty significant issues. Uh, in fact, maybe what we're saying today, you can't imagine ever hearing in a church before. You've never heard a church talk about this. But we believe firmly that a lot of these issues we're going to confront are issues that everybody has to deal with, and the Bible is filled with advice and teachings and good news and warnings about all of these topics. So that's why we want to spend some time in them, because if God's Word is talking about it and it relates to our lives, we want to dig into it. So today, uh, there's a theme and a question that I kind of introduced last week that leads through uh, this series, and, um, and I asked it last week, and I want to kind of keep asking it this week, and you'll probably hear it more as we keep going. The question is this. Are you trying to follow Jesus, or are you just trying to get Jesus to follow you? That's the question. Most people create a version of their faith that supports their opinions they've already formed. In other words, they have their own ideas about the way they want things to go, what life is about, what's most important, and then they just bring religion along behind to agree with them, right? And the big question for all of us today is, are you trying to follow Jesus where he leads, or are you just trying to get Jesus to follow you where you want to go? And today, the topic that we're going to talk about is pornography and sex. That's what we're going to dig into today. And I, I, before I became a pastor, I was a high school teacher. I spent 15 years teaching high school kids, and uh, I was the religion teacher at those schools. And so this topic came to me. I spent a lot of time talking to high school kids, leading retreats, weekend retreats, seminars, classroom discussions on pornography and sexuality and sex. And a lot of one-on-one -on -one talks with kids who are struggling with stuff. And now as a pastor, I'm still talking about sex. Because believe it or not, from beginning to end, this issue occupies a lot of our lives. And I, honestly, I've dealt with a whole bunch of different situations. I'm sure there are some I haven't dealt with yet, but you'd be surprised if I shared with you the, the, just the gamut of struggles that people have shared with me and that I've, that I've counseled and tried to help people with. I'm, and at 47 years old, <laughs> I am still convinced, friends, I am still convinced that what God says about sex is true, it's relevant, and it's good advice. It, and in fact, it's kind of common sense for those that are willing to listen and hear what God has to say. Even if you don't believe the Bible, even if you don't believe the Word of God at all, its insight into sexuality is so relevant and insightful. But Every time I talk about this, teenagers, adults, anybody, anytime I talk about this, there's always some pushback. Uh, some pushback from teens and adults, too, okay? They, they, it can feel, for me, a bit like one of those Old Testament prophets, you know, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and, and Daniel, the, these Old Testament prophets who would go and they would speak these very, these messages that people just did not want to hear, okay? Most of the Old Testament prophets got killed for the stuff they had to say, so not, not quite that far from me please do me a favor. But, um, but prophets basically were given the job to speak truth to a generation that did not want to listen. And, and it, you, you begin to sound like you're in an echo chamber. You keep saying things like a voice in the wilderness, but nobody's really listening. And, and a common reaction I get when I talk about this is, Mike, come on, nobody believes this stuff anymore. I mean, what century are you living in? I mean, this is not the world we live in. Most people who hear this message say something like this. Well, of course the pastor would say that. And then they ignore what I'm saying. They go right back to the life they were living before, thinking to themselves the Bible is so out of date, it's so irrelevant, it has nothing to do with the world I'm living in. But what's so ironic about this topic, friends, that we're going to talk about is it's strange that we even have to talk about it. I mean, the fact that I have to to try to convince you or help you understand is ironic, given that the world we live in is so messed up. Uh, forget about the Bible again for a minute. Just put Christianity on the shelf, put the Bible on the shelf. Just be honest and ask yourself this question, okay? Has pornography use and sex outside of marriage made your life better or more complicated? Get rid of all the excuses, all the rationalizations, you know, well, we're two consenting adults. It's nobody's business. Fair enough. We're not hurting anybody. Okay, maybe. We're in love. Why make porn such a big deal? Who really cares? I, just let me ask you this question. Has that stuff made your life better, or has it made it more complicated? Let me ask you another question. Has that stuff 
in our culture. How's it working out for us in the American culture right now? How is our, our view, our attitude, the way we approach sex and pornography, how's that working for us? Is pornography and sex outside of marriage, is it working for our society? Are we better off? Are we happier? Are our kids healthier and more wholesome? Are our marriages stronger? Are they lasting longer? Are, are we helping the crime rate? Is crime coming down with sexual crimes? And is it improving American lives the way we're approaching sex and pornography? Here's the irony. You don't need the Bible to tell you this. You don't need a preacher to tell you this. I wish we could get all Americans together in the same room and just say, can we just be honest for a minute? Can we stop pretending and face the truth? The way that we are using pornography and sex isn't helping us. It is not making life better and it's not working. None of us are better off because of the way that our culture is approaching sex and pornography. We have bought into a lie and we are all paying the price for it. And what's tragic about this whole thing is that often when you're making the decisions about pornography and sex outside of marriage, when you're making those decisions, sometimes, often even, you don't actually face any consequences at the time you're making it. When you're 16 years old, you're 18, you're a junior in college, you're in your early 20s, you don't actually face most of the big consequences. Some people do, I mean, don't get me wrong, but some people face some big ones, but a lot of people dodge the consequences, and what happens is they don't pay the price then, they pay the price in the next stage of their life the one that comes 5, 10, 15 years later. So if you're in the stage of life right now where you're like, I don't know, it seems like it's working for me, heads up. You're probably one stage of life away from realizing it wasn't working, it never did work. Your, your life is not better than it would have been without it. In fact, it's much, much more complicated. And look, as a pastor, I guarantee Pastor Paul and Pastor Curtis could share the same thing. Your pastors have heard all of the regrets. When people end up in our office or give us a call, something bad is usually going on and there's a lot of regret. I wish I could go back and have a do-over, right? I, I wish I could go back and skip that spring break trip. I wish I would not have answered his phone call. I wish I had not gone to her house. I wish I could do it over. In fact, I don't know that I've talked to a single person yet in my years of working with high school kids and, and adults both, I don't think I've talked to anybody yet who said, man, I wish I could go back and watch more porn. That, that's the thing that was missing from my life, right? I just needed a little more pornography. Then I'd have finally been happy. Or I wish I could go back and sleep with a bunch more random strangers. Man, if I had just done that, things would have worked out so much better for me. Or, you know, I've, I've realized that all of my problems stem from a lack of sex. That's, what my, that's really where my problems stem from. Nobody says that. Do you know why nobody says that? Because it's a lie. Because it's not true, right? And you don't need the Bible to tell you that. That's obvious to all of us. It's written on the heart of anyone willing to listen to what God has to say about this stuff. But that, that begs the question. If it's so clear that this is kind of a disaster and we're making a mess out of sex in our culture and the way we approach pornography, if it's so clear, if it's so obvious, especially in hindsight, like looking back, you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. At the time, it made so much sense, but now looking back, I realize that was just stupid. I shouldn't have done that. If it's so obvious in hindsight, why is it that if I go out and stand in the town square or I get on social media and I say, sex is for married people, the world will respond, what an idiot. I can't believe that guy says that. Nobody believes that. What a moron. I can't believe he's actually saying that. How come nobody believes it? It's because, friends, we, all of us, have believed a lie. And it was a lie that we wanted to believe, okay? We wanted to. Nobody had to twist our arm on the sex lie or the pornography lie. We wanted to believe the lie. And now we're paying the price. And our kids... Our ki if you got teenagers right now, you know what I'm talking about. Our kids are really paying the price for the world that we've created for them. Now, if you were God, we know you're not. Pretend. If you were God and you saw the mess, 
You saw all this in advance, all the consequences, all the complications that were going to come around, everything from, from child abuse to human trafficking, STDs, AIDS, single moms, broken marriages, the Me Too movement, the exploited pornography industry, spouses betrayed, lives destroyed. Given all of that, what do you think your heavenly father who loves you would say to you about pornography and sex outside of marriage? What do you think God would say to you? If God loves you and he knows what a mess this is, what do you think God would say? Do you think he would say, hey, be safe, kids? Do you think he'd say, hey, just be careful out there, be responsible? Do you think he'd say, make sure you wear a raincoat? I actually heard that at a funeral once. It was the advice his dad gave him. Always wear a raincoat. Oh. No. If you were God and you saw all the chaos that was being unleashed by our misuse and a misappropriation of sex and pornography, and you saw all of this, all the chaos, the pain, the exploitation, the damage, the regret caused by this one single issue. If you were God and you could get everybody's attention and make one statement about sex... I bet God would say something radically different than what our culture is saying. I I bet God's message would sound a little old-fashioned to us. It would definitely sound counter-cultural, and it would definitely be one we'd want to ignore because we don't like this truth. It's not that we don't know it's true, we just don't like it. So because this is such an important issue, friends, I'm going to put on my prophet robe, okay? Please don't stone me in the parking lot after this. I'm going to put on my prophet robe, And I'm going to come out here and I'm going to say what should be obvious. Ready? Sex is for married people. It is not for adults over 18. If you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you do whatever you want, okay? But if you are a follower of Jesus, your heavenly father has designed sex for married people. Not when you're ready for it. Not when you love each other a lot. God, your heavenly Father, created sex for married men and women. And I want you to forgive me for the elementary analogy I'm about to use, but, but sex, in this case, as we're talking about, is kind of like a fire, all right? It's great in the fire pit. It's great. There's nothing wrong with fire. It's good in the fire pit. You want fire in the fire pit. It's useful. It's inviting. It's, it's intimate. It's fun. It, it's warm. But if it gets outside its boundaries, it's a disaster. It's a disaster if it gets outside its boundaries. It leads to loss, pain, fear, destruction, a mess of problems, stress, regret. But I want to say this as clearly as I can. The problem is not fire. In this analogy, sex is fire, right? You follow me here? Okay. The problem is not fire. There's nothing wrong with fire. Fire is good. The problem is the boundary. That's the problem, okay? So if this is the starting point for our discussion, I want you to think about this. Any of you ever take kids camping? Like done out in the woods, you go camping? Any of you done camping before with kids? Okay. We're not a big camping family, but I've done this a couple times. You build a fire. You're going to make s'mores, roast hot dogs or something like that. And you got kids, especially younger kids. What's the first thing they want to do with the fire? They want to take a stick and put it in there, make a torch out of it, and then run through the woods with a flaming stick, right? And you're like, whoa, 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 (laughs) guys, you cannot take fire out of our fire pit and run through the woods with a flaming torch. You can't do that. But that sounds like so much fun to the kids, right? This wonderful thing, this fire that is so wonderful and intimate, it's fun, it's warm, it's inviting, it's all that stuff. This wonderful thing is going to be really destructive, if you try to take it out of its boundary and run through the woods with it. So, so this starting point for our discussion about sexuality, and, and as I challenge you to, to rethink or at least come back to what you learned earlier in your life about sex, I want to say it again. God created sex, and it is good, okay? L- God is not against sex. Christians are not against sex. That there is such a nonsense lie in our culture that anytime Christians try to say, hey, there, maybe they should put a boundary on sex. Oh, they're trying to tell everybody what, they don't like sex and God's against sex. and they're No, let's get rid of that lie. God built the fire pit. Remember the analogy, okay? He brought the matches. 
He poured lighter fluid all over it and set it on fire. It was his idea, okay? God is not against sex. So this morning, I just want to share a couple verses with you. You don't need a bunch of verses because you already know what I'm saying, okay? You don't need more verses. This is obvious. And most of you have heard this before. It's kind of like me saying, hey, don't forget to breathe. You kind of know this already. I want to jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's a book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. And, and the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, the, the Greek city of Corinth. And uh, in Corinth, sexuality was rampant, much like, say, Western culture today. Uh, their problem was a little different from ours, but not much. The, the big issue in Corinth was temple prostitution. In other words, people would go to worship the Greek gods and goddesses, and part of their worship of those Greek gods was that they would sleep with a temple prostitute. That was a form of worship. Don't get any ideas. We're not going there, okay? <laughs> Temple prostitution. So Paul is trying to confront this issue in Corinth. He's trying to tell them not to do that, okay? So they believe, the people in Corinth believe the same lie that we do. They believe the lie that you could have your marriage and love Jesus, but then you could go to the temple, have sex with the temple prostitute, and then go home again like nothing happened. And Paul's going, whoa, 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 no, 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 you can't do that. And, and before you too quickly say, oh, well, we don't do that kind of stuff. I don't know. Anybody ever go to the computer and look at porn and then head right back out and eat dinner? See, we got our own version of this. It's not quite the same, but we got our own version, don't we? We think that sex is just a pastime. It's just an activity. It's not, it doesn't mean anything. It's just something you do. The Corinthian culture believed the same lie. It's just sex. What's the big deal? And Paul jumps into this conversation like, oh my gosh, where do I start, okay? So here's God's take on the whole thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee. Paul says, run away from it. Don't flirt with it. Don't ask, where's the line? And then try to get as close as you can to it. Paul says, you find the line and then you head the opposite direction. Don't get close to it. And this word sexual immorality, we don't use that word very much, but it's a broad category, okay? And maybe you're even in the middle of it right now and you didn't even know. Like nobody's ever told you this before. You didn't even know that, that you were in this mess, right? So let's, let's talk about what would be included in this category. So uh, if you're married and you're getting a little on the side, that's sexual immorality. That's what Paul is saying here. Flee from it. If you've got a porn habit... And every week, or maybe even every day, you're looking at porn. But I'm not hurting anybody. That's sexual immorality. You're finding your sexual fulfillment in something other than the partner that God has given you. Casual hookups on the weekend. You go to a party, you meet somebody, you head home, you have sex. What's the big deal? That's sexual immorality. If you're living with somebody outside of marriage and having sex, uh, because, you know, you just want to kind of test it out. You want to see if your relationship's compatible. Again, if you're a follower of Jesus that would fall into this category, sexual immorality, all right? It's a broad category. So, so real quickly, let me summarize how the whole Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the entire Word of God speaks with one voice from beginning to end, okay? How God defines sexual immorality. Ready? Any sexuality or sensuality outside of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman, God says, run away from anything outside of that context, all other sins, listen to how Paul goes on here, flee from sexual immorality, all other sins a man commits. This is a category of one, a singular category. Sexual sin has a unique impact on people. Not because, hear me clearly, not because God gets more mad about sexual sins than other sins. That's got nothing to do with it. It's because sexual sins are in a category of one because of the way they impact you. Sexual sin takes a toll on people like no other sin does. Anyone who counsels people will tell you their experience dealing with sexual sin in the lives of their patients. It's very powerful. It's why something that may have happened to you 30 years ago is still carrying around in your heart when it has to do with sexual sin. Even if it wasn't yours, it was somebody else's sexual sin that impacted you. It just clings to us. It's not like other sins. So jump back a few verses. Paul's going to jump back a little bit. I want you to hear what he says just a little earlier. Do you not know? Didn't you guys know? He's asking a rhetorical question here, but it's a good one. Didn't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? 
Didn't you know that we, the, the people of Jesus, Jesus' followers, didn't you know that we are the hands and feet and eyes and ears of our Heavenly Father, of God? That, that when we, we live out our lives, we are doing His work, we are representing God to the world in which we live. Didn't you know that? Paul says your bodies are a part of that. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Or a hookup? Or a porn site? Now, come on, Paul, you're taking it too far, man. We're not uniting. It's just sex. It's not permanent. In fact, I don't even remember her name. Paul says, you don't understand sex. You think, see, you think you can do whatever you want. And you can walk away, and there's no carryover, no impact, no big deal. You think it's just physical. You think it's just an activity. But Paul says, I'm telling you, your heavenly father says to you this morning, I'm telling you, if you have sex with someone, you have united with them. And Paul says, let's, let's take it out a little further. So where he goes next. Do you not know? Here's that rhetorical question again. Maybe nobody told you this. Don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? God, we're not one. We talked it through in advance, God. We, we got boundaries on this. We're just friends with benefits. It was just one night. It was spring break. I was 18. It's all good. Paul says, don't you know? You thought it was an activity. You thought it was a pastime. But when you have sex with someone, you are becoming one with them. You take a part of them, and they take a part of you. This is part of the reason, too, like when you tell old college stories, or you can laugh about all kinds of stupid, dumb things you did back then, but people don't joke nearly as much about their past sexual sin as they do about all kinds of other sins. A lot of those things are funny with age. Sexual sin doesn't fit in the same category. Now, you're an adult. You're past all those young stages, right? You're, you're done with all that foolishness. Now you're an adult. You've met the person you want to spend the rest of your life with, and now you're discovering that your past has followed you. That when you got married, there were ghosts that came with you into the marriage. You're trying to raise your kids. You're trying to be honest with your kids about sex, but there's stuff you don't want to tell them about, and there's all this baggage from your past, stuff you don't want to deal with or talk about. Paul says, didn't somebody tell you this? That sex isn't just physical. It isn't just, just something with your body. It's a heart thing. It's a soul thing. It's designed to be an intimacy thing. And then Paul, making his argument, he goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, beginning of Genesis. Again, this is the Bible's consistent message from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Listen to what Paul says. For it says, he's talking about Genesis here, the two will become one flesh. This is Adam and Eve. God joined them together, brought them to each other, and then Genesis says, for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This is the argument Paul's making here. You can never completely unone sex. You can rip it apart, but you're going to leave a little bit of yourself behind. And it's going to impact your ability to experience intimacy later in your life. Pornography does the same thing, right? The thing it promises, sexual fulfillment, actually robs you of sexual fulfillment the more you use it. The, the God who loves you, friends, the God who loves you says to you, flee from sexual immorality. Because, it, because you might get a disease? Well, maybe, but no, that's not the primary reason. Ah, oh, because you might get pregnant. Well, maybe, but no, that's not the primary reason. Because it wounds your soul. It damages your ability to receive the sexual intimacy that God wants to give you. God is not against sex. There's nothing bad or wrong about sex. It's his idea. He created it, okay? He brought man and woman together, Adam and Eve, and he said, go for it. He's for you, Eve. Eve, you're for him. Go for it. But, but let's go back to where we started here, Paul's advice to the Corinthians and to us this morning. Remember where we started? Flee from sexual immorality because all other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who has sinned sexually sins against his own body. God says, listen, listen, you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to hurt other people. You're, you're going to hurt your now relationships. You're going to hurt your future relationships with people you haven't even met yet. So, so with all this, this is weighty stuff. I know that. With all this weighty stuff, what are we supposed to do with this? Right? Now, 
Usually when I talk about this, I get one or two reactions. First reaction. To those of you who believe that this is out-of-touch foolishness, fair enough. I mean, you could just smile and nod me on your way, and that guy's a moron, and that's okay. All right? This is exactly what we'd expect the pastor to preach. I got it. So stupid. He's out of touch. He doesn't get it. We don't live in ignorant Bible times anymore. I do what I want to do, and I'm not worried about it. Okay, that's fine. It's your life. You do what you want. Can I just give you one word? Here's what I want to say to you. Just one word. Would you at least remember what we talked about today? Because here's what's going to happen. And some of you in here could share stories about being in this place. One of these days you're going to wake up, and your life is going to be a bit of a mess. And you're going to be trying to figure out why. Why am I so empty? Why are my relationships a mess? Why can't I find fulfillment and intimacy? And it won't matter how much money you got, and it won't matter what your position is in the world. You're going to look in the mirror. Your gut is going to be empty. You're going to feel numb. You're going to find that you can't connect with people as well as you wish you could. You're, you're going to find a difficulty with intimacy. And maybe, maybe, when that day comes, you'll remember what we talked about today. And maybe you'll, you'll pick up a Bible and, and you'll read about this again. And you'll remember, oh, what I'm doing is not working. Your heavenly father says to you, and he will say to you on that day too, I love you. You will figure this out one way or the other. Either you will trust me and obey. That's the easy way, by the way. I, I will trust God and I will obey him. Or you'll disobey and you'll deal with the consequences because they'll all come crashing down on you. And then you'll learn that I was right. But either way, you'll learn this. But, but maybe that's not you. Maybe you're, you're, you don't think this is out of touch foolishness, but, but maybe you're thinking to yourself, look, you don't have to convince me, Mike. I, I already believe this. The problem is I've already made my mistakes. Maybe you recognize the wisdom and the calling of God in this area of sex and pornography, but you're saying to yourself, I've already made my mistakes. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. I've got a word for you too. Here's the word I want you to, to wrestle with today. The word is repent. Repent, which means to run away, to flee, to turn around and go the opposite direction. To, to, to admit that you made mistakes. To recognize your sin. You know it's following you. You know it's hanging around. You know it's causing problems. And, and all that stuff, it didn't seem to matter when you were making those mistakes in the past. It all made sense at the time. It was part of a grand plan you had. But now, it, now you're thinking, maybe it's time to repent. And maybe you need to take some steps in your life. Maybe you need to get rid of the browser on your cell phone. Or put up some of that blocking software. Maybe you need to quit traveling with certain people for business or work. Maybe you need to stay home on Friday night and not go back to that same place you keep going to. If you're not married right now, you're a single person, but you're looking to get married one of these days, maybe if you've fallen into a lot of these traps, you should stop dating for a year. That sounds drastic, but why would I say that? Maybe you should just stop dating, spend some time becoming the person you want to find, spend some time connecting with your Heavenly Father and becoming the person He wants you to be before you get back out there again. And let God work on you from the inside. R remember the main question that we're wrestling with in this series. Remember the main question. Are you trying to follow Jesus or just trying to get Jesus to follow you? Most people will create a version of faith that supports whatever their sexuality wa they want it to be. And they'll just try to find support in the Bible or in some generic God to support the lifestyle they already adopted. The big question I have for you this morning, are you trying to follow Jesus or are you wanting Jesus to just agree with you and follow you? Ask your heavenly father for forgiveness. If you've made mistakes, and we all have, every one of us, we have made mistakes. And you don't want to carry this anymore? Your heavenly father loves you, and he wants you to find wholeness, friends. He wants you to experience peace. He's already provided a way to be forgiven and come home again. Last verse, and then we're done. Paul says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Th this verse is so critical for any discussion about sexuality. To honor God with your body means saying every day, God, my life does not belong to me. When Jesus died for me, he bought me with his own precious blood and made me his child. And therefore, it's not my life. My life belongs to my Father, 
who redeemed and saved and rescued me. So God, would you now, would you please take my hands and my feet and my eyes and my ears. I want to use this body to honor you, God, and be different. I want to go where you want me to go. I, I want to look at what you want me to look at and stay away from the things you don't want me to. And whatever I miss out on by honoring you, God, and, and you will, friends, if you follow Jesus, you're going to miss out on some things that the culture says is awesome and Jesus says to run away from. You say to yourself, you say to your father, whatever I miss out on by honoring you with my body, it is worth it because I know that leads to destruction and I don't want that. I will not fall for the lie of this culture. I will not be deceived anymore. Would you be willing to do that? To repent, to flee from sexual immorality. Friends, you will not regret it. And in time, your heavenly Father will heal you, and you will find joy and new life. But it begins with repentance, a commitment to flee sexual immorality, to honor God with your body. And I want to tell you, here at Crossroad, we want to help you find that. If you need help, if you're stuck and you need help, your pastors are here to help you. There are other guys and women in this church who are here to help you. You let us know. We will keep it confidential and quiet, but we will get you the resources you need to get out of the mess you're in. Because we love you and we want to help you. You want to come home to your Heavenly Father and your Father wants to invite you home. Get on your knees today. Find a quiet place and just be honest with God and repent. And then find God's mercy and grace calling and welcoming you home again. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me pray for you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we want to come to you this morning and just deal with something kind of heavy. Kind of a big deal, Lord. This pervasive sexuality that our culture is just swallowing hook, line, and sinker with pornography and sex, the way it's portrayed in TV shows and movies, the way we experience it in our life, the way every college campus is run. We are just inundated with sexuality, and yet you have called us as your followers to live differently, to live lives that are distinct and unique, to live the way you designed us to live with sex reserved for husband and wife. God, that is not easy in this culture. There may have been times in history where it was easier to do that, but this is not one of them. It is hard to live that way. And so God, I'm asking right now two things that number one, you would empower us and give us, everybody sitting in this room, men, women, teenagers, every one of us, God, we need your help to live the life you've called us to live. We need your forgiveness and your mercy. And God, would you pour that out abundantly on those in this room who are struggling with sin and guilt from the past, stuff that's going on in their life right now they've kept hidden from everybody? Would you pour out your mercy as you call your children home and give us the tools we need to live a new life? God, we want to follow where you lead because you have bought us with a price. We want to honor you with our body. I said, now, Lord, would you forgive and then send that we may follow you? In Jesus' name, amen.